paper during a modern Cuba class, and I've always been interested in sexuality and gender, or however people construct their own identity. So I thought this was a really interesting way to get insight into Latin American sexuality. All right. <clears throat> the concept of machismo plays an important role in constructing gender norms and notions of sexuality in Latin America. Machismo has defined and encouraged a celebration for a particular masculinity that has fostered a strong tradition of patriarchy. The rhetoric and treatment of homosexuals during the Cuban Revolution provides a reflection of these constructed norms on gender and sexuality. The Cuban Revolution was deeply based in a masculine rhetoric which innately ostracized, ostracized homosexuals as their perceived feminine qualities meant that they must lack val courage and valor. This negative perception of effeminate behavior becomes more complex by the fact that women were allowed to be full members of the revolution. The intricacy of sexuality and gender as perceived in Latin America is reflected in this contradiction between the acceptance of women into the revolution and the denial of gay men due to their perceived effeminate behavior and mannerisms. It was not the expression of femininity that barred Cubans from officially participating in the revolution, but the fact that these qualities were being expressed by men. The construction of gender roles within Cuba, within Cuba and the masculine rhetoric during the Cuban Revolution designated homosexuals as sexual and social deviants. And although these actions by the government and individuals were acts of homophobia, it was the sensitivities to non-normative behavior that led to these actions. The oppression and persecution of gay men during the Cuban Revolution was not based on the concept of two men being together either sexually or romantically, but was an outcome of broken or manipulated acts of norm normative behavior, particularly gender norms, within the larger context of male superiority in Latin America. Although homosexuals in Cuba certainly experienced prejudice before the revolution, it was not until Fidel Castro became prime minister in 1959 that oppression against homosexuals became institutionalized. Military camps to increase production, or UMAPs, were implement implemented in 1965. Officially, these camps were made for the lumping community whose behavior was not in accordance with the public definition of good citizenship. In actuality, these camps were the epitome of institutionalized repression against male homosexuality. Many men who were perceived as effeminate or ostentatious were picked up off the street by Cuban police officers and forced into UMAPs. In this way, the Cuban government singled out homosexual and suspected homosexual males as deviants and then combined them to camps where they can no longer associate with the larger society. The Yellow Brigades in 1965 and the Mariel Boatlift in 1980 are other examples of the repression of and prejudice against homosexuality in revolutionary Cuba. In 1965, the Ministry of Health released a report that concluded that there was no biological cause for homosexuality, implying that homosexual behavior must be learned. This re report inspired the creation of the Yellow Brigades in Cuba. Boys who were seen as effeminate were placed in the Yellow Brigades in order to help them develop more masculine and thus more revolutionary characteristics. A second purpose of the Yellow Brigades, beyond guiding young boys to behave in a more masculine way, was to separate them from other students. Young boys were removed from schools once they were forced into Yellow Brigades in order to prevent their effeminate behavior from spreading. This practice eventually became policy in a declaration made by the first National, Cong National Congress on Education and Culture in 1976. This de declaration stated that homosexual deviations are to be firmly rejected and prevented from spreading. The Mariel Boatlift Exodus is an example of this rejection. In 1980, a mass immigration of Cubans left for the United States. Castro had allowed many former convicts and other Cubans deemed unfit for Cuban society to leave the country if they so desired. Since homosexuals made up a significant portion of these immigrants, it can be inferred that Castro believed that homosexuals, along with the rest of the lumpen community, were anti-revolutionary. These two incidents, along with the UMAPs, are compelling evidence that homosexuality was not tolerated within revolutionary Cuba. Interpretations of homosexuality in Latin America are heavily influenced by machismo. The concept of machismo concerns the celebration of masculinity and manly sexual and physical virility and reflects on Latin America's insistence on the superiority of men. Machismo also clearly differentiates sex roles. This contributes to the complexity of defining who is a homosexual, as a man's sexual orientation is defined by the passive or active role he takes during sexual intercourse. It is only the passive role that retains negative connotations of homosexuality, as this is the feminine role during sex. In this way, heterosexual men could have sex with non-masculine gay men without threatening their own heterosexual identities. Many men who perceived themselves as heterosexuals, yet still had sexual relationships with gay men, were full participants in the Cuban Revolution. 
This separation between sexual practice and sexual orientation is pivotal in not only understanding the role of homosexuals during the Cuban Revolution, but to a larger extent, their role in Latin America. When gender roles are applied to sexual practices, and the passive role is implicitly understood as feminine, a reflection on women within Cuban society becomes pertinent to understanding why gay Cubans were oppressed during the revolution. Although the Cuban Revolution led to many positive changes for women in Cuban society, this did not mean traditional stereotypes lost their influence. Although women were encouraged to enter the workforce and to become active members of the Cuban economy, sexism can still be inferred by the dual responsibilities women were expected to undertake. Although women have been allowed more economic opportunity in post-revolutionary Cuba, they are still seen as the main caretakers of domestic life. This tendency to perceive women as having the predominant role in domestic life is discussed by Teta Puebla in an interview with Mary Alice Waters in 2000. In this interview, the Cuban Brigadier General relates how men are reluctant to offer any help with household tasks as they are not seen as a man's responsibility. This exemplifies how gender roles still play a large part in the conception of femininity and the role of women in Cuban society. This prevalent theme of women being subservient to men in Latin America has a strong influence on the treatment of homosexuals during the revolution. While the oppression of women and gay men in Cuban society are both influenced by machismo, it is important to note that the forms and levels of oppression differ significantly during the revolution. Fidel Castro addressed the role of women in society, and he actively worked to eliminate many negative perceptions. His belief that women could be effective revolutionaries was shown in his decision to make a unit from the all-female Mariana military platoon his personal bodyguards. This altering in perceptions of gender roles for women helped women obtain greater freedoms within Cuban society while leaving homosexuals in the same state of oppression. This is because gender roles for women had shifted enough in society in order to promote greater equality, allowing women to act in new ways that do not contradict gender norms. Homosexuals, on the other hand, were still breaking the construction of masculine gender norms with their perceived effeminate behavior. The pervasiveness of machismo within Latin American culture led to socially punitive outcomes, more so for men who did not maintain traditional male appearance and mannerisms, than to homosexual behavior itself. This implies that even if a man were somehow objectively heterosexual, if his actions were perceived as effeminate, he would still potentially be a victim of social oppression. During the Cuban Revolution, standards of masculinity were also derived upon ideal images of women rather than just examples of revolutionary men. In order to be an effective revolutionary, a man must act in ways that a woman did not. This notion, combined with socialist rhetoric, made the lack of adherence to gender roles and norms a significant factor for the cause of oppression against gay Cubans. A letter written to the North American Gay Liberation Movement by the Cuban gay people expresses the disdain that homosexuals experience as they walk down the streets. Many homosexuals were asked to produce ID cards or harassed by police simply for having certain hairstyles or clothes that did not reflect Cuban socialist society. The letter does not mention their sexual practices with other men. Rather, it's the non-normative behavior they perceive to exhibit that is the cause of this conflict. As these gay men walked down the street, their clothes and hairstyles not only broke gender norms, as they were seen as too flamboyant, but this flamboyancy was connected to bourgeois capitalism, breaking yet another revolutionary taboo. These perceptions on gender norms and sexual roles were so prevalent within Cuba and Latin America that homosexuals themselves were participants in this dialogue. This can be seen in the experience of one of the most prominent homosexual and gay right advocates in Cuba, Ronaldo Arenas. During Arenas' discussion of his sexual exploits as a Cuban exile, he states that he derived little pleasure from these experiences. The reason, the reason why has much to do with gender concepts being applied to sexual roles. For example, Arenas do not, does not understand how reciprocal sex can be enjoyed as he believes that homosexuals are looking for their opposites. In this context, someone's opposite is defined by what role a man takes during sexual intercourse, either the masculine or the feminine role. Homosexuals in Cuba participated in the construction of these stereotypes that alluded to the lack of masculinity that is perceived as inherent in all gay men. As these concepts in sexuality imply, only the person who takes a passive role is associated with femininity. Arenas illustrates this by using the feminine pronoun her in his explanation of a sexual partner. This explicitly denotes the person who takes a passive role as having feminine qualities as he is referred to as a woman. Non-normative behavior within revolutionary Cuba was seen as a threat to a burgeoning socialist society. The lack of adherence to gender norms designated homosexuals in Cuba as the antithesis of a socialist revolutionary. A homosexual was seen not only as a danger to a cohesive socialist society, the determination to break normative behavior was seen as contagious. 
Gay men, as well as lesbians, who refused to adhere to normative gender roles were often charged with crimes against society as a result of their sexual behaviors and gender identity. Under the declaration by the First National Congress on Education and Culture, gay men were no longer allowed to be in positions of authority where they could potentially influence the Cuban youth. In this declaration, the First National Congress on Education and Culture states, Cultural institutions cannot serve as a platform for false intellectuals who try to make snobbery, extravagant conduct, homosexuality, and other social aberrations into expressions of revolutionary spirit and art. Non-normative behavior is thus deemed to include more than just sexual deviation. The point of contention is expressed as deviation from the norm, not the concept of homosexuality itself. The term for normative behavior was not the only cause of oppression for homosexuals. For many revolutionaries in Cuba, there was an obvious linkage between homosexuality and petite bourgeois counter-revolutionary ideology. This is an outcome of the anti-capitalist rhetoric of revolution in Cuba. Bourgeois tendencies were not only outside of the acceptable norm, but a direct threat to the development of a communist country. The breaking of gender norms, combined with the perception that homosexuals had bourgeois tendencies, which, also, which was also considered non-normative behavior, only furthered the negative perceptions of homosexual, homosexuals in the Cuban Revolution. The Cuban Revolution was highly influenced by rhetoric revolving around the new socialist man. In an essay, Ernesto Che Guevara states that in this period of the building of socialism, we can see the new man being born. Through the struggle of the revolution, a new definition of man was conceived, and this would epitomize the struggle, selflessness, and sacrifice that a true revolutionary would need to exhibit. This definition of the new man had significant negative consequences for homosexuals under the revolution. This new definition, while still being a novel conception, was still based in perceived gender norms and stereotypes influenced by machismo. According to Che Guevara, it was a new socialist man that was needed in order to maintain a successful revolution. A letter written by the members of the Cuban gay community to the North American Gay Liberation Movement states that homosexuals experience discrimination as an outcome of this new man. As the new socialist man had to endure sacrifice and struggle, this new man had to bear the, bear the strength to endure these hardships. By breaking the masculine gender norm, negative perceptions were automatically applied to gay men, which in the context of the new socialist man, set them directly against the ideal of an effective revolutionary. Rhetoric on the new socialist man was inherently sexist since it includes any mention of the role of women in society and revolution. This sexism reflected the treatment of homosexuals in a response to the declaration by the First National Congress on Education and Culture by the Gay Revolutionary Party cites this exact connection. The Gay Revolutionary Party explicitly states that it is perceived sexual and social roles that are the root of all exploitation, meaning that a significant portion of the gay community within Cuba was aware of the effects of gender norms on the treatments of homosexuals. In effect, it was the creation of the new socialist man and the reinforcement of these gender norms, which, homosexual, which homosexuals did not adhere to, that led to detrimental consequences for the gay community in revolutionary Cuba. The interplay between machismo and aspects of male dominance in Latin America created a hostile environment for homosexuals in revolutionary Cuba. Homosexuals were institutionally oppressed and removed from society. UMAPs and yellow brigades were implemented in order to address the issue of homosexuality and keep bourgeois tendencies from spreading. The perceived break in gender norms only added to the perceived non-normative behavior of a homosexual and his bourgeois tendencies. Rather than expressing homophobia as an outcome of sexual or romantic, romantic intimacy between two men, participants in the Cuban Revolution were reacting to the non-normative behavior that threatened a develop, developing socialist society.